simply put, the Palm Beach State Attorney's Office was ready to let Epstein walk free, no jail time, nothing. Prosecutors in my former office found this to be completely unacceptable, and they became involved. Our office became involved. That was outgoing Labor Secretary Alex Acosta defending his role in a 2008 plea deal for accused sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein. Acosta blaming Florida prosecutors for apparently letting Epstein off the hook, prompting questions about whether those attorneys could face consequences more than a decade later as federal prosecutors pursue new charges against Epstein. Let's bring in our legal panel. Richard St. Paul is here. He's a defense attorney and a member of the Republican Trial Lawyers Association. Misty Maris is here and she is a trial attorney and we are going to get to the blame game in a second. But Richard, I start with you here. Did Alex Acosta, who was U.S. attorney uh, for the Southern Florida uh, at the time, give Jeffrey Epstein a pass in 2008 by shelving his 53-page indictment that could have sent Epstein to prison for life? Well, look, on first look, it certainly seems like a 53-page indictment would send somebody to jail for a very long time, if not their life. And instead, Epstein ends up with 18 months. But Acosta says this. He says that, look, uh, if we went to trial, it would have been a roll of the dice. So we did the plea deal, which guaranteed Epstein 18 months in jail. We still need all the facts on whether that's true or not. And certainly when you hear the involvement of everybody from state, the state's attorney's office to federal prosecutors, the potential for uh, witness tampering and witness intimidation that's taking place in this case, there's a lot of facts that need to come out to determine whether or not Acosta's behavior was that of a prosecutor trying to do their job and get justice or somebody who just caved in to Epstein's defense team. Mm -hmm. So, Misty, we played that soundbite. Last week, Alex Acosta blamed the Palm Beach State's Attorney's Office. Is he right? Well, essentially what he was saying is that the state's attorney's office was going to charge Epstein with a crime that would have carried no jail time. And that's when federal prosecutors, that's when his office intervened and negotiated this plea deal that did, in fact, carry jail time. So his argument is that the federal prosecutors actually secured a more severe penalty than what the state was even going to go for. Now, whether or not he's right, look, I believe the state's uh, decision to be a factor in how the federal prosecutors decided to handle this case. It's not a determinative factor. It's one of many factors. As Richard pointed out, the question here, once we have all the facts, is whether this was prosecutorial discretion, were there evidentiary issues that would have put a verdict at risk, or was this prosecutorial misconduct? Two very different things. But, Misty, wasn't that so-called jail time 13 months with conditions that he could um, have a pass to go to work yes. six days a week. So that means one day a week, 13 days total in jail. Right. And that's what we call a slap on the wrist sentence, of course, given the allegations. But there's definitely factors that go into the analysis of what a prosecutor is going to do and what a prosecutor brings to trial. Listen, Arthel, the responsibility remained with the federal prosecutors to charge Epstein and to make that determination. So how that plea deal played right. out has nothing to do with the state prosecutor's office. It has to do with the decisions that the federal prosecutors made. Well, we're talking about this because That's of right. the great work by the Miami Herald. So I want to read a paragraph from the Miami Herald right now. It says, quote, Epstein's lawyers, who in addition to Jack Goldberger, were Alan Dershowitz, Roy Block, Kenneth Starr, Guy Lewis, and Jay Lefkowitz demanded that the deal be sealed and kept secret from Epstein's victims. Acosta acquiesced. Emails show even though victim notification was required under federal law. So, Richard, how much collateral damage will be done as prosecutors go after Jeffrey uh, Epstein and attempt to bring justice to his alleged victims? Look, I think that line right there that you just read is that low-lying fruit of uh, as Misty mentioned, prosecutorial misconduct. If the federal law says that the witnesses need to know about what's happening in the case and they didn't follow that, they better have a very good reason as to why they didn't follow that. Now, the, the team that you just talked about, that legal powerhouse team that uh, has included as pa pa part of its clients, presidential uh, presidents uh, and others, you know, that is a very serious legal team. 
uh, that basically had just as much resources um, as the federal government. And I think that's something that's going to be looked into in terms of what also the legal team had to do with uh, creating pressure and witness intimidation, potential witness intimidation, um, and paying off witnesses to weaken a prosecutor's case. I think that's another aspect that we have to take a look at and that might come into what this fallout might be. In addition to the other fallout, Epstein has known a lot of people. When we're talking celebrities, we're talking presidents, their families, uh, the, the royal family. Anybody who has been a witness to his uh, misconduct is going to be a potential witness in this particular case. So, so Misty, if Jeffrey Epstein's money and his power bought him a get out of jail free card. Can anyone be held legally responsible uh, retroactively? There absolutely could be consequences. What we have right now is this dual path. We have the Office of Professional Responsibility for the Department of Justice investigating this situation now. There, the, the repercussions from that respect, that's just going to be identifying whether or not there was any misconduct because many of the players are no longer employees, so there's really going to be no teeth there. But What's more interesting is that the SDNY in Manhattan, the Public Corruptions Division, is investigating this case. That tells me that there's something more to this investigation than just the, human, the sexual uh, trafficking allegations, the conspiracy allegations. That usually goes to a person in position of public trust. So that could extend to prosecutors, that could extend to the state prosecutors, that could also extend to any misconduct by the defense legal team. It's going to be something when we find out exactly what happened. My biggest issue with this is that violation of the Victims Protection Act. At Richard said, as Richard said, there's really very few excuses for that, so I think we're going to see a lot of fallout on that angle.